Celeste is one of those games that I've been recommended a lot since starting this channel, and after only about an hour of playing it, I understood why. I could see the potential good that this game offers its players, and one quick search into what the Celeste fanbase believes the game has offered them psychologically or emotionally, and you find all kinds of results about how helpful Celeste has been to its players. It has showed many of us something we hadn't seen or noticed before about ourselves and encourages us to contemplate mental health. It's a rare example of how video games, even platformers, and not just first-person AAA titles can be a source of inspiration for developing personal resilience and exercising self-compassion. As a screen therapy review, I'll be looking at what Celeste can do for us as players, psychologically and emotionally. Specifically, what benefits we gain when engaging with its story and mechanics mindfully. I've split this review to cover the two major aspects of the game and how each helps us the mechanics, and the narrative. Playing Celeste can be a humbling experience. In Celeste, you play as Madeline, a young woman who's challenged herself to climb Mount Celeste. Along the way, she meets new friends, it confronts both external and internal obstacles, as it becomes clear that she struggles with some mental health concerns. The mechanics of the game are beautifully rendered, but the design of each level is almost mercilessly difficult. The developers purposely created Celeste to be a challenging game. Although they fine-tuned the mechanics with precision and gave the game a great feel, they also meticulously designed each level to be progressively more difficult, and sometimes you're required to finesse through gaps or over obstacles that allow just a hair-thin margin of error. Some players, like myself, could die dozens of times trying to make it across one room. For players like us, which I call the inexperienced platformer, it can take hours to get through one chapter. Even with this level of difficulty, players have shared their surprise that even though it's such a difficult game, it still inspires a sense of zen-like flow for them and can be genuinely enjoyable. Through its masterfully orchestrated combination of music, mechanical feel, and fail-friendly language, Celeste accomplishes a strange but exciting new type of flow for the majority of its players. The idea of flow has been talked about a lot in the circle of game essayists, but just in case you don't know already, flow describes the optimal experience for completing a goal. The perfect meeting between personal skill and task requirements. If the tasks in games or in real life are consistently too easy for our skills, we get bored and the activity is no longer intrinsically motivating or interesting, and will most likely abandon the activity because it doesn't offer us any sense of meaningful mastery or growth. This means a game that puts us in this area is too simple or we're too experienced for it. If the tasks in the games are too difficult for our skill level, we enter this kind of zone of frustration. Here, our skills are being tested. Although we're playing a game, we're not exactly relaxed because we're being challenged. In this area, we have to push ourselves to refine our skills as we struggle to get to the sweet center of the flow experience. And it's in this center region that we find flow. Our skills and task requirements meet comfortably. This is when we get in the zone. The tasks can get harder, but since we get better at performing them, we rise up to meet them. And there's always just enough challenge to keep us interested, but never enough to get us overly frustrated. This is the sweet spot where most games aim to keep their players. This area is highly absorbing and fulfilling. We can play games in flow for hours and hours without feeling the time pass. This is where we feel less like we're trying to beat a game, but more that we're actually just playing it. However, this is probably only where highly experienced platform players live when they play Celeste. Our experiences of playing Celeste could vary greatly based on our skill level and based on whether or not we use the assist mode. For the average platform player, you might find yourself around here when playing. Just out of reach from flow, so the challenge is a bit uncomfortable, but flow is so close to your abilities you're enticed to keep struggling and growing until you get it. And for the inexperienced platformer like myself, unfortunately I found myself here, just near the rage quit zone. Although these types of players will have experienced the game differently, those in flow would have felt relaxed and absorbed. They would have gotten the full positive effects of flow like detachment of everyday stressors, relief of negative feelings, heightened mood, strong feelings of competence and efficacy, and a fortified sense of short-term well-being with an added boost of life satisfaction that can strengthen long-term well-being too. 
and other players in my rarely ever play a platformer region should have felt frustrated, burdened by high stress, and close to giving up in order to release ourselves from the negative feelings of dying so many times in the game. But I actually want to make the argument here that what makes Celeste such an inviting game, even with its tough difficulty progression, is that the compassionate feel and fail-friendly mood of the game might have buffered some of those stress-inducing effects of the game's high difficulty. Although I was definitely out of my element playing Celeste, and my death count was way too high for me to admit publicly here, I often found myself close to experiencing a state of flow while playing too. When I let myself relax, paid attention to the kind language on the loading screens, and listened mindfully to the intentions of the developers which was to encourage us to fail as many times as we needed to in order to learn and get better at the game, I felt invited into a pseudo-flow state of mind as well. I wasn't as bothered by repeatedly dying because of the high stakes pressure I usually feel playing tough games. I was able to accept that I needed to learn and I wanted to learn. This is particularly tough for someone like me, as a chronic overachiever in real life and in games, I'm too used to pushing myself to having to be as perfect at a game as possible. And while it definitely didn't help my perfectionism when my platform savvy boyfriend completed levels in the fraction of time it took me, still, the language and culture of Celeste helped me release some of those high expectations and I could instead get excited at an opportunity to grow and learn. The mood of Celeste created this kind of buffer that widened our expectations of what mastery and flow could feel like. This put players like myself and those with average skills and platformers in this great resilience building zone. The energy that would otherwise have gone to frustration or stress over failing so many times could, for longer durations, be converted into energy we spent to learn how to get better at the game. This region is also where the magic happens for developing a growth mindset. A growth mindset is the incredibly helpful perspective we can adopt that acknowledges that there is such a thing as failing well, and that we can grow and conquer challenges even if we need to fail a lot first. With this mindset, we're not defined by our mistakes, and if we aren't inherently talented at something on our first try, we don't jump to the conclusion that we're just stupid. A fixed mindset is believing, despite the evidence, that we can't change or adapt, and that we were born with our talents as they are, and will die with them just the same too. We, like Madeline, discover through our gameplay our own growth mindset, and that we are capable of learning and growing through adversity. This resilience building zone might be the experience that the developers were aiming for all along. If you're familiar with this story and its themes of resilience and overcoming difficult obstacles, you'll see the parallels here between what the player feels and what Madeline must feel, which I'll touch on shortly. But my last point on the topic of mechanics is of course the highly discussed assist mode that players can turn on if the game's default difficulty makes it inaccessible to them. This assist mode is not only a great accommodation for players who need it, players who are often overlooked in game development, but very useful for players who are looking to simply tailor their experience and bring themselves into a flow state. Players who tweak the game difficulty to bring down their stress levels and save them some energy can go from frustration into enjoying all the benefits of flow. In my opinion, this is not a loss. Usually decreasing difficulty in games can lead to embarrassment, shame, or the nagging feeling that we're not truly playing the game right. I would like to propose the perspective that those using assist mode are simply tuning what benefits they want from the game and aren't necessarily experiencing anything less. Players could be bringing themselves down from the rage quit area to the resilience building area that the developers might have wanted for us, or if they've had a hard day and they just don't have the energy to challenge themselves but still want to enjoy the world of Celeste, they could be bringing themselves from the kind of tough resilience building area to the very friendly flow area. The only way a player could miss out on any benefits from gameplay is if they were to try to force themselves to play while their skill levels keep them in the rage quit area, where they're adding unhelpful proportions of stress onto their shoulders and will most likely abandon the game, or if they oversimplify gameplay into the boring region. But I think most players will only tweak as much as they need to either make the game playable or to get into that flow state. They wouldn't purposely make the game too boring for themselves. Assist mode is a great option for players with limited time or energy and aren't able to spend several hours learning to perfect their platforming skills. Those who need or simply like to use assist mode are just selecting a different kind of experience for different benefits. 
All players in the end should feel free to play without external or internal judgment as they want to so that they can access the enlightening and comforting story of Celeste. The story of Celeste is incredibly helpful. Although the gameplay has been fine-tuned to deliver many layers of benefits for its players, it's really only given its depth and importance by the story we helped Madeline act out. As we help Madeline up Mount Celeste, we learn from her talks with new friends that she's battling anxiety and other mental health concerns. Eventually, we even come across a new character called Part of Me, who looks like a spookier version of Madeline. Some players have called this Madeline's dark side because this entity is a part of her and does exhibit some hurtful behavior towards her and others. We see the part of Madeline undermine her determination to reach the peak, engage in negative self-talk, and she even lashes out at Mr. Oshido. This can remind us of our own habits when we're feeling mentally or emotionally unwell. We, like this part of Madeline, might have bad habits of putting ourselves or others down because we're in pain or we're scared. Eventually, we see Madeline reach the conclusion that she needs to abandon this part of her. When she tries to calmly make this decision to ignore and leave this side of her, the darker side of Madeline fights back and sends her back on her progress. This might be analogous of those experiences some of us have had where we try to ignore our mental health needs or pretend trauma or other negative emotions don't exist. We might try to convince ourselves that if we don't look at or engage with our darker halves, that they'll just go away. But these negative feelings often force their way into our lives, sparking unhealthy behavior until we commit to a journey to process them. And this is what Madeline learns. She learns she can't simply cut off parts of her that are hurting. She learns that her dark side is acting out of fear and pain, and that the answer isn't abandonment, but the opposite. Madeline has to make amends with this hurt and skittish part of herself, and they must work together to become stronger than before to overcome future obstacles on their ascent up the mountain and towards self-actualization. This is a beautiful metaphor for recognizing that our negative feelings, moods, and habits aren't things that just need to be pushed down or to the back of our minds, and they don't need our negative judgment either. We learn from Madeline's story that we also need to calmly and kindly make friends with ourselves, remove negative self-appraisal, and we might need to regain some of our own trust. It might not be easy, but if we work with ourselves, look at our darker sides with open and compassionate eyes, we can also tap into some of our own hidden strengths. The way Celeste was written, the writers made talk about mental health upfront and clear. They took out all the guesswork around its mental health themes and laid it out plainly. They even gifted us with an in-game example of a wonderful mindful breathing technique that can and has helped players with their own anxiety in real life. The writers showed us parts of Madeline that might look similar to ourselves and gave these hurtful aspects of her the space, patience, and attention they deserve. This story offers us the benefits of eudaimonic storytelling. In case you're new to my videos, the spectrum of emotional impact that any piece of media can give us is between hedonic and eudaimonic impact. Hedonic includes stories and games that are simple, sweet, fun, and lighthearted. They can help us relax and recover from stress. Eudaimonic stories usually elicit complex and mixed emotions. They can be tragic or thrilling stories with serious, meaningful themes. And we can actually gain psychological growth from eudaimonic titles too. Neither type of game is better for us than the other. They simply offer different benefits. Celeste is definitely on the eudaimonic side of the spectrum, but closer to the middle because of its hedonic game mechanics and the overall uplifting and accessible message of the story. From Celeste, we can get a great mixture of benefits, but I really want to cover the elements of Madeline's journey that can actually help us on our own journeys towards eudaimonic well-being. The school of thought is that there are two types of well-being. Hedonic well-being is all about feeling good, cleansing negative feelings, maximizing fun and enjoyment. But the idea of eudaimonic well-being allows the understanding that mixed emotions can lead to more profound well-being, which is characterized by personal growth and meaningfulness. Madeline's story is all about fighting to achieve most of the elements of well-being that psychologists have listed out, such as mastery, which is successfully mastering challenges in life, like reaching the mountain peak of Celeste, personal growth, which is the understanding that we can grow and develop as a person, self-acceptance, which is the understanding that even if we make mistakes, we can still love ourselves, positive interpersonal relationships, like making new friends on our journey, and autonomy, 
Our goal to experience self-actualization and inner freedom, which is waiting for Madeline at the peak of Celeste. So let's put it all together. The reason the story and the gameplay of Celeste feels so good and helps us so much is because we, as Madeline, are pushing ourselves through incredibly tough obstacles. The gameplay mechanics guide players through a mirrored ascent with Madeline. We work hard to get her to where she needs to be and feel like a part of her story. With her, we're learning more about our anxieties or depressive symptoms. We're learning a bit about how to process them. We're meditating on the importance of relationships and friendships, not only with others, but with ourselves. And we're walking Madeline through the steps to accept herself and to achieve the personal growth she needs. By playing Celeste mindfully, we're embarking on our own climbs to appreciate the importance of self-compassion, self-acceptance, and the mindset that we can overcome our struggles if we work with ourselves, and that we should anticipate and budget for setbacks or mistakes in our journeys through self-growth. Just as we need to fail a lot at getting good at playing this game, we need to armor ourselves with the understanding that we'll make lots of mistakes and have a lot of difficult days on our own mental health journeys too. I highly recommend Celeste to anyone who might need a little practice in failing well, withholding negative judgment, building resilience, and embracing those prickly scared parts of ourselves with compassion and acceptance. Thank you for watching. I recently collaborated with fellow essayist Zalty Boy and a great team of others in our video How Games Teach Us Empathy. I really recommend checking it out. If you'd like to see more about games, movies, and well-being, please subscribe and leave any suggestions in the comments below. Thank you, and as always, happy playing.